So hi there and welcome. Uh, this is the, uh, the plan for today. Um, on Monday, we're planning to do some uh, problem solving examples that are relevant to the synchronous midterm assessment. So uh, speaking of which, <laughs> The synchronous, the first synchronous midterm assessment is gonna be Tuesday, September the 29th from 8.10 to 8.40 p.m. on Quercus. It's a 30 minute um, Quercus quiz. It's based on chapters one, two, three, and your practical week one material, which some of you are starting today. This assessment is open book, meaning that you are fully allowed to use the textbook, the course lecture notes, the mastering in my lab stuff, pre-recorded videos, you know, Google searches of static web pages, etc. as resources, all those are fine. All that we ask is that you must do this assessment individually. You are not allowed to communicate with anyone else during the assessment. So you will need a quiet spot and a computer with a good internet and no interruptions around you for this assessment. If you have an academic conflict, like a class or something, or uh, some research commitment that's you know, part of U of T, you can apply to write the alternate sitting, which will be exactly two hours later on the same day. So it'll start at 10, 10 p.m. and go to 10.40. So April Seeley has just sent out an announcement on the Quercus with a link to a form where you can uh, type out your reason that you wanna do the alternate sitting, and then, then you can just do the alternate sitting. We'll set that up for you. Non-university related conflicts such as work or time zone issues will not be considered. There's no third sitting, so you have to do one or the other. And let me just quickly look at what's going on with the uh, Q&A. And also, uh, put panel participants up on here. Um, there's a question about the homework and how it's how it's worth how much it's worth so that's there's a good place to on on uh, Piazza I've answered that question several times on Piazza and so there's a little at 22 where you can find that the answer um, <laughs> questions about angry birds are we allowed to use a cheat sheet or a formula sheet for the midterm assessments? absolutely yes I would suggest actually that it would be a good idea for you to write down all the um, the really useful uh, bits of knowledge or equations and things that you tend to use and have those handy somewhere as part of the notes. I mean, it's an open book, right? So you can certainly use a, a formula sheet. And there'll be short answers. I think about 10, 12 questions. You're going to get more details about that as, uh, as we get closer to it. Hopefully that answers some of your questions. Okay. So moving right along. <laughs> Seem to be full of energy today. Oh yes, so today is the deadline to do those pre-course diagnostic quizzes. There's the FCI about physics and the class, which is about your attitudes about science in general. Um, and you know, to encourage you to do the test, you'll receive one homework credit for each one of them. You get credit for participation in the surveys, but your accuracy does not matter. However, I would encourage you to try your best on it. Ah, and practicals. Uh, you should notice that on your ACORN timetable, in addition to these LEC, the lecture sections, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 11, you are also in a two hour uh, PRA block, a practical for this course. That means that's like the labs, okay? Um, and the, the practicals were canceled for the first week as they always are, um, so that we can train up all your TAs. There's actually 55 TAs, teaching assistants, in this course. And we've been having all kinds of meetings and getting people all excited and, and ready to go. So you will have a TA and the TA to student ratio is 18 to one. So it will just be you and 17 other of your friends and one TA who will be able to help you and really deal with your questions. So as opposed to Zoom, practicals are gonna be run on Microsoft Teams. So it's another app you have to install. Um, they begin on a Friday to Thursday cycle, meaning that if you have Friday practicals, they actually start or started today. 
and some, some of you have already been there. But if there's other days of the week, it'll be somewhere between um, today and, and Thursday when you'll do your first practical. So hopefully those went well. Um, hopefully you got the link from your email. Uh, so this is another thing that you should be aware of and uh, that you need to speak with your microphone during practicals. If you can't actually talk because you're in some environment where you're not allowed to talk or your, your microphone's broken, you will be marked absent. So that's really important. And it's also, I think, good to have a, um, your video on so people can actually see you as well. Um, so Carla, you, uh, Viette, you raised your hand. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. So it's about the pre-course quizzes. I didn't really get an email or a link uh, for them. I don't know where to find those. Okay, well, it's good to be able to receive emails. Um, maybe your email didn't get set up or something, so you should just send me an email. Most people okay. got it, and a lot of, like, like I say, about 80% of the, the class has done it. So this is something, if you email me today, I can try to sort you out. Okay, thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Okay. Excellent. Oh, and we'll do one more. Um, Wei Wu, did you have a question? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can. So, um, so about the practical, I'm enrolled in um, practical 0101, but I did not receive the link to the ah. thing. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, so um, which day of the week is that? Is it Monday one? Yeah, it's the Monday one. Yeah, yeah. So that's a really good point. So I said there's emails coming out, but not all the emails have been sent yet. So I should have mentioned that actually, is that oh, uh, you will get an email before your first practical. So okay, within you. 24 hours of your first practical, you'll get that email. So okay, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, you for I asking. I was just afraid that I was missing it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That's a good question. So the first question was about the email for the pre-class diagnostics. You should have definitely gotten that already um, uh, five mm -hmm. days ago. But as for this email about the, the practical Microsoft Teams link, you might not have gotten that email yet, especially if you have like, you know, next week's practical. So, so I'm, I'm glad. Oh, I, okay. Thank you so much. No, you're welcome. Glad I'm actually taking questions here because you guys are asking fantastic questions. Oh, and this is the checklist. If you haven't done your practical yet, there were three things that Professor Maple asked you to do. Read the practical syllabus, uh, complete your week one pre-practical assignments, and the, assignment, the due date there is uh, 24 hours before your practical start time, and download and install the Microsoft Teams app on your computer, in addition to your Zoom apps. <laughs> okay, let's do a poll. <laughs> okay. Oops, let's... Uh, before we launch polling, a car starts from rest and then drives to the right. It speeds up to a maximum of 30 meters per second. It coasts at this speed for a while. And then the driver hits the brakes and the car slows down to a stop. So that they're gonna ask, we're gonna ask three poll questions about this entire motion. First question, while it is speeding up, what is the direction of the acceleration vector of the car? Is it A to the right? Uh, B to the left, or C, zero. Okay. You guys got it, most of you, about 90% have voted, so I'm gonna end the polling. And yeah, 91% of you voted for A. So that's absolutely correct. Um, basically, if the, while it's speeding up, if something's speeding up, that means acceleration and velocity are in the same direction. When, when that's associated with speeding up. Okay. Next question. While the car is coasting, is the uh, acceleration to the right, acceleration to the left, or is acceleration zero? C, to, C zero.
Um, and we're going to end polling there. So actually, 75% uh, of you answered C0, 17 answered uh, B, and A um, uh, was 8%. So, um, so the answer that I was looking for there is as a zero. Um, so co by coasting there, what I meant, uh, maybe this was unclear, but I meant is that the, the V is constant. And if that is the case, for whatever reason, um, maybe it's a frictionless wheels or something like that, then you would say that the acceleration is zero. Does that make sense? That might have not been the, the uh, best phrased question, but hopefully you get the physics. Oops, we're going to relaunch the polling, sorry. New question. As when the car is slowing down, while the car is slowing down, what is the direction of the acceleration vector? This will be the last question of the sequence. What does coasting mean? That's a good question. Okay. Good, good, good. I'm going to end that polling. Share results. Yeah. So 92% of you got what I was trying to get at there, which is that if it's slowing down, slowing down means that, um, so I'm looking for B here, that the acceleration vector is opposite direction to the V vector, the velocity vector. So the velocity is still towards the right, but now the acceleration is towards the left. So at last day, at the end of class, I asked you to think of an example of an object with a negative acceleration, which is speeding up, that's one, um, think of an example of an object with a positive acceleration, which is slowing down. Okay, that's two. And then three was think of an example of an object with zero velocity, which is accelerating. So what I want to do is turn the camera around and demonstrate all of these on the, the big Pasco track with a cart. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to define positive to be towards the right. Sense so um, so it'll be and and I guess parallel to the track if the track is inclined. I'm going to incline the track. So you ready? I'm going to stop the share and become big. Okay. So what I want to do is. Turn the camera. And there's my track. Okay. So here we have a track, and as we've said, we've defined um, positive to be towards the right. So let's grab this. Sorry, I'm trying to remember what the questions are here. So uh, Yeah, first one was, think of an example, one, uh, an object with negative acceleration, which is speeding up. So that would be if it starts over here and goes backwards. So the velocity is negative and the acceleration is negative, okay? So it's speeding up. So both the velocity and the acceleration are the same sign or the same direction in this case, and it's speeding up, so that's one. Think of an object with positive acceleration, which is slowing down. So for positive acceleration, I think what I need to do is put the book on this side. So now it's positive acceleration, but speeding up. You can launch it with negative velocity. Negative velocity, it's slowing down, but it's positive acceleration. And then it's speeding up again. But until it gets there, it's slowing down, going slower and slower, but that's because the acceleration vectors to the right, but the velocity is to the left. So velocity is negative in this case, and acceleration is positive and slowing down. Three, 
Think of an example of an object with zero velocity, which is accelerating. Ah, yeah, so that's the same thing. So uh, we can do it this way. We can uh, launch it with negative velocity. Boom, right there. At that moment, when it got to the highest point, it had zero velocity, but it was still accelerating. So the entire time, it's accelerating down the hill. Um, but the velocity starts off being uh, negative, and then it switches to be positive. And since something goes from positive to negative, it has to pass through zero, right? So at the top of its motion, it's got zero uh, velocity, but it's still accelerating. Okay, that's the demo of the day. You guys are going to get bored of that track pretty soon. We'll have to do some different demos. Okay. Go back to share screen. Put the Q&A. And chat window. Whoop. It always takes me a while to reset up my, yeah, no penguin. <laughs> sorry about that. I need the participants, those two, sorry. You guys have to bear with me every time I stop sharing my screen, my Zoom gets completely messed up here. Okay. There we are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, let me do Aria. Do you have a, uh, a question? Aria, the line. Hello. Hi. Hey, I have a question for the uh, practicals. I was currently in the Friday practical, but I changed it to uh, Tuesday. Uh, mm -hmm. So would I receive an email later on or? Yeah, maybe. Again, some of these emails have don't get really sent out until it's kind of like time, right? I see, because uh, I was trying to be group mates with my friend, mm -hmm. but we were not in the same section in the previous practical, so we changed it, so we maybe have another chance. That's why we tried to change it. Yeah, so in general, for everybody in the class, uh, if you're making switches on, on the practicals, you can, the person who's in charge of that is April Seeley, and if her email is uh, PHY131 uh, fall, at physics, so you can check with her, and that's pretty much all, all you can do. Um, and yeah, have you tried? Yeah, have you Sorry, I, I, I just want to keep going in here, um, but definitely email is a good way to, to, uh, to get answers to those kinds of questions. It's the only way, really. Okay, so um, this was the slide from last time that I didn't quite get to. So. Uh, we are familiar with, if we've, I'm going to call this X versus T, this is a position uh, versus time plot on the bottom. And here we have what's called a parabola, meaning that something has got a curved line, so the velocity is not constant. The slope of this line is always changing. And so you can plot velocity. I'm going to change all these S's to X's to match your textbook a little better. Um, velocity versus time graph. This will be the slope of, of this one. Um, and then if you make a plot, so this has a constant slope. If you make a plot of acceleration versus time, then this is the slope of that one. Okay, this has constant slope all the time, which is positive. And then if you know a little bit about calculus and the, the integrals and stuff, then the integral and the, the book spends a lot of time doing these areas. So I'm going to say area under graph, the area under the acceleration versus time graph, also known as the integral. So the slope is the derivative, time derivative. The opposite of doing a time derivative is an integral, and that's the area under the graph. And also the area under a velocity graph, uh, velocity versus time graph is the position area under graph. So that's sort of how these things work. Integral. Where you had to take the derivative of the position versus time graph um, to get the velocity. 
Okay, so there's a joke. Um, and it's a little bit old fashioned because uh, it comes from Richard Feynman. But the question is, um, so it's basically a story about a woman who is uh, pulled over for speeding. And there is a police officer that comes along, uh, you know, to the side of the road and uh, he comes up and he says, lady, you were going 75 kilometers per hour in a 50 zone. And the lady says, I'm sorry, officer, but that can't be. I've only been driving for five minutes. So what she is saying is that you can't go 75 kilometers per hour if you've only been driving for five minutes. She didn't go 75 kilometers to anything. And so you might think that's kind of a, you know, uh, a ridiculous thing. But I mean, the question is what Feynman posed is, well, how would you answer that question if you were the officer and tried to approach sort of this from a sort of a physics perspective? So he says, no, no, no. What I mean is, if you had continued driving at that speed for one hour, then you would go 75 kilometers. And then the lady says, I'm sorry, officer, but that's not true. If I had continued driving at that speed, I would surely have crashed into that wall at the end of the street. To which then the officer gives up and says, here's your ticket, tell it to the judge. Okay, so there's an idea here of um, instantaneous velocity. So on a velocity versus time graph, velocity will be a, a straight line, or I guess a horizontal line, only if it is constant. I shouldn't say straight, let's just say horizontal. If the velocity of uh, instantaneous velocity is the velocity of an object at a particular time, average velocity is the ratio of the change in position and the time interval during which, which this change occurred. So for motion at a constant velocity, the instantaneous and average velocities are equal. And for motion with changing velocity, they're not. So um, what we have here, well, I'll, go, I'll get back to this in a minute, but um, there are, three equations of constant acceleration from your reading in chapter two. One is that the velocity at any point is the initial velocity plus the acceleration times the time. That's equation 2.5. I'm not going to derive it in class, but you can definitely read about derivation. Um, 2.6, equation 2.6 is that the final position is the initial position plus this v0t plus one half at squared. Um, and then the last one, 2.7, is something about the change in position times 2 times a is equal to the change in, changes in speed. So the strategy here is that if you have a problem in which you know that the, the acceleration is constant, then you can use one of these equations. And the difference between these different equations is that they're all missing one of these variables. For example, if you look at equation 2.5, there's no x in there. And so if you have a problem in which you don't care about x, then maybe equation 2.5 would be a good one to write down. For equation uh, 2.6, nowhere in there does it have the final velocity. So if you don't care about the final velocity for some reason, it's not asked for and it's not given, maybe that would be a good equation for you. And equation 2.7, it doesn't contain time anywhere. So if the time doesn't matter in the problem, that could be a good equation for you. So I'm putting those up. Let me take a quick look at what's going on on the chats and stuff. If we replace the X for a D because of old habits, is that fine? Absolutely. You can call it S, you can call it D, you can call it R, <laughs> as long as you don't call it late for dinner. You want to get the right answer, right? And so these will be numerical problems where you have to find an actual answer. Um, yeah, can I assign questions to prepare for the midterm? I'm definitely going to, to try to do that, give you some practice. Um, yeah, and I'll talk more about how many questions are going to be in the test coming up. Let me see if I can unmute. Ezra, do you have a, a question? Oh, I just had a question like yeah. like the past slide, like where you did uh, number three, zero, 
zero velocity, but it's still accelerating. I don't know why it was still accelerating at that point. Like at zero, like when it was at the the peak of the incline. Yeah, yeah. Still accelerating at that point. Ah, yeah, that's a good question. You mean when I did the demonstration? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so actually what I'll do is I'll just sort of try to draw on the side here to, to answer Ezra's question. So let me just, I'm gonna mute you again, but thank you for that. Um, the way that I can try to answer it, um, so if acceleration is the slope of the velocity curve, and do you remember in my demonstration, what happened is that I started the cart with a negative velocity. It was moving towards the left at first. So that means at time zero, if you're plotting now V versus time, it would have started off with negative. And then it, what happens is it slows down. And by slowing down, that means the, the absolute value of V gets less, it gets closer to zero. So this is what the curve looks like. Um, and then, at, so it goes up the hill, stops, and then um, goes back down the hill because the hill is, is going to the left. So it goes up, it goes negative velocity for a while, and then it comes around and goes positive velocity. So Ezra's question is, at the time at which it gets to zero velocity, how can it have acceleration? And what I'm telling you is that if I use a red pen here and figure out the slope of this curve at zero, it's not zero. Okay, so this is a, a really, really important thing to, to, uh, to know is that velocity and acceleration are not at all the same thing. Um, acceleration is just the slope of the velocity versus time curve. So velocity can be zero and it can have a not zero slope. Great question. Okay, so um, let me try to find my notes here. Good to run around, because then the lights don't go off. Um, yeah, I don't have that. So uh, Here's a case where something is slowing down and it has a positive velocity. So an object starts at 10 meters per second and ends at five meters per second. So for 1D motion with constant acceleration, the average velocity is one half of the initial plus the final velocity. So this is V average is equal to V uh, initial plus V final, if you don't put the F on it, meaning so it's the final divided by um, two. So for example, if something starts at 10 meters per second, this is V initial. And if the final V at uh, five seconds is equal to zero because it's stopping, then V average here over this five seconds is equal uh, to five meters per second. And also V average is equal to the total distance X minus X zero um, divided by the time. So you can combine these two equations and get a really useful equation, which is that if you do V average equals V average with these two different things, you get V zero plus V divided by two is equal to X minus X zero divided by T. And you can I guess solve that out. X zero minus, or sorry, X, the change in position is equal to the average velocity times the time. So that's one equation that is not actually in your textbook. I call it an extra, which is it does not contain A, but you know it's constant. So this comes up sometimes in problems, but this is the average velocity here and there's time. Okay. Okay, so let's do an example. Let's say you're traveling at 30 meters per second and you suddenly hit the brakes. Your uh, maximum acceleration is 10 meters per second. What is your minimum stopping distance? So by the way, 30 meters per second 
I asked Siri, um, I said something like, hey Siri, what is uh, 30 meters per second in kilometers per hour? 30 meters per second is 108 kilometers per hour. Whoa. So that's 108 kilometers per hour, according to Siri. So that's pretty fast, but it's not unusual to be driving that fast if you're out on the highway. And the question is, um, how far, what's your minimum stopping distance? Say you see a deer or something run out in front of you, how much uh, distance will you need uh, before you stop? So the sketch and translate phase, I'm going to draw a little car. And it's going along with V0x, I'm going to say is 30 meters per second. Um, the acceleration in the x direction, like maximum, absolute value is 10 meters per second squared. It's kind of important. And the question is, how far x will it go? I'm going to put x as question mark. That kind of indicates to me that it's important. We're going to need to find it. Um, some of my assumptions here, I'm going to assume, sort of in the simplifying diagram phase, that a x is going to be equal to this a x max. You're going to accelerate at your maximum acceleration um, in order to get the minimum distance. Make sense? Um, x. And also a sub x is negative. So it's going to be equal to negative 10 meters per second squared if the velocity is positive. I'm going to put define plus towards, towards the right. Okay. Um, and then I'm also going to, here in my simplification, I'm going to set x0 equals 0. It starts at origin. I'm running a little space on this PowerPoint. Hopefully you can see it. OK, so then represent mathematically. So the knowns here, uh, I know the V0x. I know the Vx final is 0. Doesn't really say that, but that's kind of, that's the thing, right? You're going to stop when your final velocity equals 0. So that's important. Um, and what else? We know A. OK, and we need x. So what's the variable we don't care about? Don't care about t, the time. So if we go back and look at these equations, um, it looks like this crazy equation is the one that we want, equation 2.7, because it doesn't contain uh, t. So let's use um, equation 2.7 from the textbook uh, and solve for x. So there's no x, x0 equals 0, don't forget. So it's x equals v squared minus v0 squared divided by 2a. And then you solve it. So uh, x equals the final velocity 0 squared minus the initial velocity was 30 plus 30 squared divided by 2 times negative 10. And I got 45 meters. So that kind of far. Um, you know, 100 meters, I guess, would be a football field or something. So you're half, halfway down the soccer field or something. But so this is pretty far. But I guess not surprising for highway speeds. So there's an idea that you should probably evaluate your answer and think about whether it makes sense. Like if I gotten 4.5 centimeters and I said, wow, I was going at 108 kilometers per hour and you know, acceleration 10 meters per second, that sounds pretty reasonable. It's like gravity, right? You're slowing down, getting pressed you know, to the, the steering wheel. And I stopped in 4.5 centimeters, that, you know, I would say that doesn't really make any sense. Maybe I made a mistake on my calculator somewhere, but 45 meters maybe sounds about right. Not surprising. Okay. Let me just put that over here and see what's going on. Uh, I don't understand why acceleration is negative here. So, um, so what's so what acceleration the the direction of the acceleration 
is determined by whether the object is speeding up or slowing down. If it's speeding up, the direction of the acceleration is the same as the velocity. If it's slowing down, which it, you have to in this case to stop, then the acceleration is opposite the direction of the velocity. So I defined in my step one, my sketch and translate, that the initial velocity was positive. I just chose that. And so in that case, the acceleration must be negative for it to slow down. Do you want us to show units in the calculations or just the final answer? I often leave off the units in my calculations. I think the book is a bit more careful about that. You definitely need units in your final answer though. <laughs> Should I look at the Q&A as well? I'm not gonna go back. I'm gonna be posting all these notes. So I'm not gonna go backwards right now because we are getting towards the end here. Let's see if there's a raised hand. How about Ishmael? Did you have a question? Yeah. So I was watching through the um, steps that you have been doing. Yeah. Um, like uh, sketch and translate, simplify the diagram, represent mathematically and solve and evaluate. Yep. So what if we can jump from the first step to the third step and then you know carry out and evaluate will that be a problem yeah that's a really great question um so this addresses uh something that's um i think on a lot of people's minds is just how picky our marker is going to be about whether or not you use this particular method that's outlined in the textbook and so um that might be a good question for your tas who are going to be marking your practicals um, but what i would say is that when you're getting started and when you're um, you know, trying to do your best in practicals, I would say definitely try to use all these steps explicitly, especially at first. Um, I, I think you, know, you can, not all of you, but some of you can, uh, mo most of you I'd say would be maybe more novice problem solvers. And when you're a novice problem solver, you should go through kind of these, these steps. Now, as you get better at physics, and you know, I find myself sometimes skipping some of these steps, um, and it's maybe a little sloppy, but I tend to get to the right answers because you know, I'm an expert, I've done you know, thousands of these problems. So um, I would say safest thing is to try to use these steps at first, and, and definitely you know, ask your TA, is this gonna be okay, and, and um, be careful, okay? So my, my recommendation is to try at first to use these steps and see how they work for you. Thank you for that question. That's a, it's a, it's a really good one. Okay, free fall. Free fall means falling under the influence of gravity only with no air resistance. Freely falling objects on Earth accelerate at the rate of 9.8 meters per second per second, or 9.8 meters per second squared. And that, you know, the exact value, whether it's 9.8, or 9.79 or something like that depends on where you are on the Earth's surface. It's not a universal number. This 9.8 just is something that applies if you're near the surface of Earth. Out in space or on a different planet, it would be a different number. So, and you can maybe uh, assume that there's three significant digits, three in 9.8. 9.80 is fine. And there's a little animation. Um, so this is showing the same ball at three different instants, zero seconds, one second, two seconds, and three seconds. So after one second, the velocity here, the speedometer is showing the instantaneous velocity of 9.8 meters per second. At two seconds, the instantaneous velocity is 19.6, so it's going faster. And that's why it travels farther. And then at three seconds, it's going 29.4 meters per second. So it's gone even farther. So the motion diagram has further spaced out dots, but the velocity is just increasing, you know, by plus 9.8 meters per second every second. And so, on. so we're gonna take an angry bird, which I have one right here. I'm gonna throw it up in the air and it's gonna come back down again. So it starts with an upward velocity, which is a maximum height, and then it falls back down again. And I wanna do three um, uh, poll questions about this motion. So the first question is, while the bird is going up, 
What is the direction of the acceleration vector of the bird? Is it A, up, B, down, or C, zero? So on the way up, which is its direction of, of acceleration? Okay. Give you another five seconds. Four, three, two, one. So 72% of you answered that its uh, acceleration is down um, and 27% uh, answered that its acceleration is up. So which is it? So what I think the way you want to view this is that after it leaves my hand, so after it's left my hand, it has a velocity, initial velocity, V0 is up. Does that make sense? And it goes up, it looks like it, it might be going up, but it, then it stops and comes back down. So I think if you're on the way up, you have to be slowing down. Because again, it, when it gets to the top of its height, if you, if you sent it exactly straight up, it's gonna stop. So it's slowing down. So that means acceleration vector is opposite the direction of V. Opposite of up is down, so I was looking for, for B there. Make sense? Okay, next question, hopefully, is when the bird is momentarily stopped at the top of its path, what is the direction of the acceleration vector of the bird? Is it uh, A, up, B, down, or C, zero? Mm, this is a little more controversial of a question here. Okay, so let's end polling. Three, two, one. So, 60% um, of you answered uh, B, the acceleration is down, um, and 36% of you answered C, the acceleration is zero. So what I'm thinking is that at this exact moment, I would say, so Ezra asked this question exactly before, but the, let me try to say it a different way, which is that just before this moment, what moment, it was going up, uh, uh, going, up. Okay, so V1 um, or something is up. Make sense? And then just after, just a little moment later, it is going down. Sorry about my handwriting. So V2 is down. So the acceleration is going to be equal to V2 minus V1 divided by some delta T, some small delta T. Just a tiny little moment. But V2 was going down and V1 is going up. So this down minus up, so you're adding two down vectors because a, a minus vector is the opposite vector. So you're adding two downs, it's going to be down. So the answer is B. And this might be, delta V might be very small, but delta T is also very small. And anytime you divide by a small number, uh, it makes it bigger, right? So no matter how, you know, how much it's just a small little uh, change in time, you end up with actually 9.8 meters per second squared, even at the top of its path when it's momentarily stopped. And the last question obviously will be uh, if it's on, as the bird is on its way down, but before I catch it, 
is the acceleration vector uh, A up, B down, or C zero? Okay. So that's pretty good. Give me another four seconds. Three, two, one. And... So here again, um, is, it actually was B every time. <laughs> so, and this is the thing. So this is the idea with free fall. Is this down, down, down. So it's not like a car. It's, uh, there's no forces on the angry bird except for the force of gravity. Force of gravity is pulling it down, so it's just going to accelerate down at 9.8 meters per second the entire time. Um, and I had a question, which I don't think I'm going to do, about um, a basketball versus a tennis ball. This is actually a little bit more of, I'm not going to launch this as a poll, this is more of a chapter three question. You've got a 600 gram basketball and a 60 gram tennis ball, and they're dropped from rest. Uh, so as they fall to the ground, air resistance is negligible. Um, What's, which is true about the force? The force of gravity is 10 times greater on the basketball than the tennis ball. The force of gravity is the same on both balls, or the force of gravity is slightly larger on the basketball than the tennis ball. I'll just tell you the answer there is that the force of gravity is 10 times greater. And so this is, a, this is actually a chapter three, it comes from equation 3.8, which says that the force of gravity is proportional to an object's mass in grams. So since it's 10 times more massive, it'll be 10 times more force. So, however, even though the force of gravity on the earth, of the earth on the basketball is more than the tennis ball, if you drop them, they fall, whoop, they, all, they both bounce at the same time, they fall at the same rate, 9.8. This was Galileo's amazing discovery, and in 1633, the Roman Inquisition found Galileo gravely suspected of heresy for his scientific findings and sentenced him to house arrest. He had grapefruit and grape and was saying that they fall at the same rate. And so he remained in under house arrest for nine years and, until he died actually. So it's not only not obvious, but it's actually offensive to some people. Um, and we don't want to do that slide. Sorry. Where do we want to go here? Look what I want to do. Um, so again, what I'm going to do is turn off the recording in a minute. And I'm going to linger on this Zoom for 20 minutes. Um, I'm going to try to deal with some of these Q and A's. Feel free to raise your hand and I'll try to go through to the top to the bottom. 1220, I'm going to shift over to Gather Town and then I'm going to hand off to a TA so I can get my lunch. But before class two, five on Monday, um, the first problem I'm going to do on Monday morning is uh, chapter two, problem 80. This is about some people in a hotel who are seeing some water balloons being dropped in front of their window. And the question is, you know, what floor were they dropped from? So I'm gonna take up this problem and some others and try to get you thinking about this synchronous midterm assessment. We'll do that on Monday, finish off chapter two. So thanks very much and have a great weekend, everybody.